I did condense a few of the slides, so we've got our significant digits now all on one side. Slide. So your sig fig rules on determining your sig figs up at the top, followed by what happens when you do different operations and your rounding rules. So this slide could be helpful when you go through and work problems. You should have everything on this memorized, okay, in one form or another. You don't have to know the words, but you have to know how to apply these rules. Make sense? Uh, how do we measure really big or really small? So that's going back to this. Remember the kilo, centi, and milli? You will be tested on multiple times throughout the test. Uh, the other ones you are responsible for, but don't show up quite as often, which means if you want to just pass the class, just barely pass the class, kilo, centi, meteor, and uh, sorry, milli, you're going to need to know. If that's all you want to do is just barely pass the class, then you probably don't need to spend any time memorizing any of the others, and you'll just accept the point loss. Okay? Um, that's within a metric system. If we move to the English system, you'll notice the formatting's a little bit clearer in their table because they go through and provide you the equation at the end. Okay? And that's ultimately because we can't do just the prefix rule in there. Okay? So we're looking at inches converting over to centimeters. We don't have uh, as easily formatted a table for the other one. Okay? One thing I do, let's see, I don't think I've got it on the next slide. No, I don't. Okay. So if we go back to that real quickly, sorry, that was a lot of back and forth. Um, let's pick a conversion to look at real quickly. So let's say uh, the inch to centimeters. Okay, the reason why I want to take a look at this is what that equation said was one inch equaled what? 2.54 centimeters. So first question, are you going to be required to have that memorized? No, I won't make you memorize the English to metric ones. I'll give you the English to metric. Okay. The next big question is how do we use this? Okay. This equation is designed to allow us to convert between inches and centimeters. So this is the format that you'll see on the test because it takes up less space. Your usable format is then deciding how you want your result to come out. If we're trying to figure out centimeters... So if our question asks, what's our centimeter value, mm, purple. that means when we go through and do our conversion, so we'll have whatever our number is, mm, let's make that a little bit longer, so we'll do whatever our starting number is, likely in inches, where do we want to put the centimeter unit, in our numerator or denominator? Numerator. numerator. And our inches unit? Denominator. So on the quiz with showing your work, I was very proud of that, very happy. You guys set up your units very, very well. The next issue is bringing in the numbers. And I noticed a lot of people putting the numbers in wrong. So how can we fix that? Well, go back to what the equation says. It says 1 inch equals 2.54 centimeters. So what number should show up in front of the inches? 1. Why 1? Because that's what the equation gives you. So we put the 1 in front. Again, sloppy 1, but hey, it's close enough. What goes in front of the centimeters? 2.54. Okay. What if we wanted to convert into inches? Well, we'd start with some number in centimeters. Again, look at our conversion factor. Okay, where do we want our inches to be in our answer? Numerator. Numerator, which means in our conversion factor, where do the inches need to show up? In the numerator. Where should centimeters show up? Denominator. Great, we've got our units set up so that they cancel. Now make sure you put the numbers in correctly. <laughs> what number goes in front of inches? One. Wow, that's not getting any better. And what number gets in front of the centimeters? 2.54. Okay. So when you process, go slowly through it. Set up your units, then put in your numbers. Okay. Where did this really, really show up? Okay. I saw a lot of conversions because on our quiz, we had a lot of time conversions. 
So I had people converting between hours and minutes. Excellent. We needed to do that. And what did they end up doing? Okay. Looking at it now when you're not stressed and there's not a time clock on you, that might be a little bit easier to see as, oh, whoops, that's a mistake. Okay. The reason I personally think this shows up is what you end up doing is saying it's 60 and 1, I'm just going to put them in there. The order really, really, really matters. Okay. So when we do this conversion or when we say it, what would we say? We're going to talk about it in English. One hour is 60 minutes. All right, mathematically, what we're saying is one hour, again with the ones, equals 60 minutes. When we go through and do our conversion, what number, according to our mathematical equality, needs to be in front of the hours? One. Okay. The one shows up there, 60 shows up in front of the minutes. Attempt this slowly. Okay? Like I said, I'm really, really happy with how you guys are putting together the units. I'd say probably 95, 99% of you are setting up your units correctly when you do these conversions, putting them in the right spots. Then there's a good 20, 30% that are messing up the numbers. Okay? And that's because you're trying to rush through it. Okay? That's one thing to rush through a problem because you're nervous about finishing the exam. Don't worry about finishing the exam. If you rush through the exam and finish it but get all the answers wrong, it's not a really good result. If you take your time but not finish it, but get all the answers that you answered correct, your score is much, much better. Okay? So when you put in your units, spend the time to assign where your units need to show up. Then spend an equal amount of time deciding where the numbers should show up in front of those units. Okay? That should help you go through that process a little bit cleaner, a little bit smoother. Questions about that? Okay. So no one's going to make that mistake ever again, right? Okay. Percents. Uh, this was our unitless information. We kind of rushed through this at the end of the last class. Uh, I'm not even sure I have the question still up there. I don't. All we're trying to do is relate one quantity to our total sample. The questions that you'll see, I'm pretty sure in your homework, and I'm like 90% certain on the test because I just pulled some questions into it, are alloy questions, like we saw on Tuesday. Sorry I deleted that question from it. But in that question, we said something along the lines was bronze is, is an alloy. I'm going to abbreviate with this because I don't want to write it all out. Bronze is an alloy uh, of copper uh -oh, and tin and tin. Okay. It had 78.2 grams of copper and 12.8 grams of tin. What's the percent copper in the alloy? All right, so what we're saying is we want to know a percent. So a couple things we could jump to. We can put in our answer. It needs to be in percent, which means we will also need to multiply by 100 percent to get our percent across. The next part is putting together our percent calculation. Well, if I just ask the question, how much copper or what's the percent copper in the alloy by mass, we'd be saying the grams of copper in the grams of our alloy. Okay, how many grams of copper were in this? 78.2. And then the grams in our alloy are the 78.2 plus our 12.8. And we now have our calculation. Do the addition first, then do your division. Okay. Did I actually remember those numbers right? Does that come out to 88 something? Or 88%? What's 78 and 12? Ah, oh, so I did it wrong. 
So let's fix that real quickly, just so the math comes out the same. 11 and 11. So that when we go through and do our math, we would have 78.2 grams of copper and 90 grams of our alloy. Definitely ran out of space on this. Multiply that by 100. Your calculator spits out the number, hopefully 88%. What would you report as your answer? Okay, so let's put down some multiple choice answers where I don't have any space to do it, but let's do it anyway. I heard a 90%, throw in an 88%, probably see an 88.0%, how about a 90.0%, and goats, why not? What's our answer? 88.0. Why 88.0? <clears throat> we have to go back to our sig figs. 78.2 has how many sig figs? Three. It has three sig figs. How much does 90.0 have? Again, three sig figs, which means the answer must have three sig figs. So our answer comes out at that 88.0. <coughs> Questions about that? Yes. On this, we don't round up because the 8 is greater than 5. So question about rounding. If we take a look at your calculator, uh, we'll leave it in red at the far left. Your calculator tells you, anybody do this and it does come out at 88? So what was the 78 supposed to be? That was right, it didn't come out to 88 percent? Okay. I was guessing at the numbers. So the number came out at what? 86.88. Okay. Um, so let's go through and fix the multiple choice answers. I was hoping I nailed the numbers right but apparently I did not. What would our possible answers be? You would probably see 86.88, 87, why not an 87.0, 86.9, how about an 86.8, oh, why not, let's throw in some goats again. Which of those is the correct answer? How many sig figs in your answer? Three. Three. So let's go and look at what the calculator spit out, which is over here. Let's underline our three sig figs. 86, 8, 6, 8. Those three numbers need to show up in our answer. So that would potentially put up 86.88. But before we do that, evaluate that first insignificant digit. Is that What's that relationship to 5? Is 8 bigger or less than 5? Bigger. bigger, which means what do we do to the number in front? We round up, so our answer becomes 86.9%. We do not round to 87, because that removes information that we had. Okay. Questions about that? Now that we've actually got a reasonable number. In this case, there's nothing. Oh, yeah, you've got the 100 to multiply, yeah. That 100, how many sig figs in that 100? Someone said infinite, which is the correct answer in this case. We're looking at a percent. We'll come back to that in a second, too, because I definitely messed that up a little bit. Um, our 100 here is the total parts. It's a count. There are a hundred parts, not 101 parts, not 99 parts. There are exactly 100. If there, are, if there is an exact number of them, all of those digits are significant. If we added an extra zero at the end, decimal point zero, still significant. 
still significant because it's exactly one, not a small amount more or small amount less. We have an infinite amount of zeros trailing off of this, okay, because it is exactly at 100. Does that kind of make a little bit more sense? Yes, the infinite trailing zeros. Infinite trailing zeros. Okay. Questions about this, with this problem? I now have to double back. I forgot about one thing. Um, anybody see the note that I made on that last video? Talking about measurements. Particularly when we went through and did our conversions. Um, I don't remember what number you guys worked with. Do we have 45 miles per hour? Are we talking about that one in this class? At 80? I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult anyway. I'm going to make it 86. All right. And I went through and said, okay, this is our value, and we could rewrite this as 86 miles per one hour. All right, so that we could use that as a conversion factor. So if we wanted to convert our time, let's say two hours, and we wanted to convert that into miles, Make this 2.00 hours, and we want to convert it to miles. We would say 86 miles in our numerator, and our hours cancel in our denominator. We punch that in. Um, what do we get? 172. Did I do that right? We get 172 miles traveled according to our calculator. As with all problems, we now have to evaluate our sig figs with our answer. Okay, so we would go back and take a look at the values that we started with. How many sig figs? How many sig figs? This one comes out at 2, and this is where I think I made a mistake. Did I talk about that one with you guys? Why do we ignore that one as far as our sig fig count goes? That one technically has infinite sig figs. The 86 still has two. Why does the one come in as an infinite amount of sig figs? It's exactly one. Why is it exactly one? And I'm pretty sure this was the question that you were asking about. This is why I remembered it. All right. What was our measured value for our speed? was 86 miles per hour. We already did a calculation to get 86 miles per hour. Okay? So our measured value is 86. What are the sig figs in 86? Two. Why is the one not come into play? We invented that so that we could see our fraction, okay? our unit conversion. So that one we brought in as a definition. That one was not a measured value. That one is specifically a one, exactly one. When would that number actually carry sig fig? Sorry, sig figs. Okay, we could make it a decimal, but how would it get a decimal? What if I said we traveled 86 miles, or let's see if I can do the math, 85 miles in 0.9 hours? Now the 0.9 carries. Why? The 0.9 was a measured value. The 86 was a, or our 85 was a measured value. That was the value that we were actually measuring. In this case, the value that we're measuring is a speed. It includes both those units. Okay, so the one that we bring in will carry infinite significant digits. Okay. Does that kind of make sense with how that approaches? Yes. So you can almost say like whatever you're canceling it with or whatever it almost the conversion factor is, that's gonna be a measurement and not just something you can help with. You wanna say that again? Um, I don't really think it makes sense, so which makes sense. Well I just I said so you could almost say like whatever the conversion factor is or whatever you you're canceling it with would most likely be a measurement. Careful, that doesn't, even, that doesn't work in this problem. 
Our conversion factor is 86 miles per hour. Our other measured value is this two hours. Okay. How many sig figs show up in our answer? No, because of one. Two, because of the 86. We don't bring the one into it because the one was not a measured value. The one was an exact one so that we kept that 86 conversion factor. Okay. Your conversion factor can force the sig figs in your answer. Okay. It's going to depend on what's given. Most of the conversion factors that we work with, when we're looking at English to metric, those ones, we assume three. Okay. Because we're told those. In this case, this is a speed. Okay. So we are measuring a speed. We're bringing in that one so that we can see that equation a little bit better. But our measured value is the 86, not the 1. So when we look at our sig figs, our sig figs go to the measured value, 86. Yeah. So now when we go and look at the answer, what would we report as our final answer? Underline our sig figs, 1 and 7. Last significant digit, relationship to 5. Less than 5, so we make it 170 miles as our answer. Does that answer your question from yesterday? Okay. That 2.00 hours would be given in the question. How far do we travel in two hours? So we have to write that way Can you guys be quiet, please? What's your question? Why do we include those zeros there? Because this was our measured value. Our measured value included to the, what's that, hundredths place? Mm -hmm. So we must include that. Don't bring in minutes. That's a separate issue. You don't want to do that. Okay. This is a decimal value for hours. Okay. Sorry, minutes and hours are not related by tens, they're related by sixties, so that you can't do that conversion in that you're trying to do. Okay. Why do we have to keep those zeros there? Because that was our measured value. That's what we were told. It was 2.00 hours. If you remove those sig figs when you do the calculation, how many sig figs would you report in your answer now? One. One. You lose information. We would end up saying that our miles per hour, instead of being 170, would have to shift to 200. Or sorry, instead of 170 miles, it would have to shift to 200. Because we don't know exactly how long it went. So those zeros were a measured value. Every number included in our, uh, in our measured value, as long as it's a significant digit, must be included in your calculation. So you gave that number? I gave you that number. You would see that number in the question. I know, fun stuff, right? <sighs> okay. Volumes, just to make things more fun. Volumes are effectively another compound unit. Okay, mathematically, if we were going to solve the volume of a cube, that's the easiest one, or even a rec not a rectangle, a cubular rectangle, for lack of a better description, a three-dimensional rectangle. We would take the length times the width times the height, and we'd multiply those values. Length, width, and height are all what measurement? Type. Length times width times height is volume. A length is not a, a volume. It's a distance. So we'd be looking at units of meters or some prefix thereof. Okay? So one way that we were initially measuring our volumes is we had standard shapes like squares. You can go back to geometry if you remember anything about geometry. I don't. We could measure cones, measure cylinders, all sorts of other fun stuff, circles, spheres. And we could measure those regular shaped volumes with particular equations. When we went through or when we look at uh, volumes in the metric system, Okay, we tend to shift away from the standard length, width, and height measurements. Why? 
What is the volume of your hair? Do you have a length, width, and height? Mm -hmm. For all of your hair? Mm -hmm. Really? You're going to tell me the length of your width <laughs> for all the hair on your head? Or the volume of your body? How much space do you take up in the classroom? You don't have a regular length, width, and height. I'm pretty sure I'm not a rectangle. Okay? We could approximate and we could start to guess at different things. And as we further refine our approximations, we could get closer and closer to the most accurate volume. But we want to come up with some other way to measure that. So what's our standard unit when we're looking at volumes? We tend to skip away from this three dimensions of distance. So if we looked at our length unit, in this case, we have, for the cube, 10 centimeters 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which gives us 1,000 centimeters cubed. So that would be our length measurement of volume. We haven't mentioned that one before. What's our base unit per volume? So the base unit assumes no prefix. Liters is the other one that we typically see. Okay, I'm going to write that out, liters. So what's the relationship between this length measurement and our base unit? Okay, well, someone had to come through and define what that relationship was. Any guesses? Must. Turns out 1,000 centimeters cubed is by definition one liter, which is what this chart or picture is trying to show. You've got that cube with your dimensions on all sides. And what do they have in the upper right? That cube equals one liter. So by definition, a cube that measures 10 centimeters on a side is one liter. Why did we do that? How many of you like exponents? How many of you don't like exponents? There we go. Okay, some class participation on that one. Okay, so we made up a new unit to try and get rid of that confusing exponent issue. Okay? So when we go through and evaluate these things, you have to be aware that you might be doing conversions within the liter system, milliliters, deciliters, megaliters, all of that fun stuff. You might then have to convert that into English. What's our English unit per volume? Ounces, quarts, gallons. Okay? So you'd need to know what those English conversions are. We're going to throw in a wrinkle. You also have to worry about this potential length measurement for volume. Okay? And that exponent is what's going to be a little bit tricky when we go through and deal with these. Okay? So we've got our liter defined as that cube. So now let's try and come up with a metric conversion skill to determine the unit factor for centimeters cubed to milliliters. Okay? For those of you that are familiar with what a centimeter cubed is, yes, it comes out to be one milliliter. Don't cheat. Don't use that. We want to use our other conversion factors to see what we can do with this. Okay. So if we start with centimeters cubed, we're going to try and get to milliliters. We want to know what we're putting in here to get that conversion. Okay. Have we established any conversion factors yet? We have a relationship between centimeters cubed and liters. 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters gives us one liter, which means we could go through and say 10 times 10 times 10, or 1,000 centimeters cubed is one liter. Is there a relationship between liters and milliliters? What's that relationship? 10 to the third milliliters. Remember, we'll put in our power of 10 in front of our prefix unit. Whoops, I did that backwards front of our base unit. Oh, that's what I was doing. You gave me a different conversion. Our prefix unit for milli was what? 
No, it's not 1,000. What's our prefix unit for milli? Go back to that table. Anybody have that table handled? 10 to the negative 3. We put in that prefix or that power of 10 in front of our base unit. 10 to the negative 3 liters is 1 milliliter. Those of you jumping with the 1,000 relationship, okay, what you've done is decided that you don't like that 10 to the power of 3 and have done a mathematical equivalency. As far as memorization goes, if you have no idea what's going on with that mathematical equivalency, don't listen to them or me. Go back to what your milli means. The power of 10 goes in front of the base unit. Okay? Milli meant 10 to the negative 3. Put that number in front of the base unit, the one without a prefix. The next part is to put 1 in front of your prefix unit. Okay? No, 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 no. You will not get marked off on the test if you go the other way. Okay? The reason why I suggest you do it this way is because some people haven't learned the other method for doing that conversion. Um, and this way you will always be correct. When you put in your power of 10 in front of your base unit, it doesn't matter anything else. It'll work out perfectly. If you go with the other method, you end up putting in your power of 10 in different spots, depending on if you're getting bigger or smaller. That can be very, very confusing. Okay. What's the net result as we do this calculation? What is 1 times 1? Okay. What is 1,000 times 10 to the negative 3? It comes up coming out as 1. What's our units? Liters cancel. We get milliliters on top, centimeters cubed underneath. <coughs> the centimeters cubed cancel. So what the question asks, determine the unit factor. What is our unit factor? One milliliter per one centimeter cubed. There's our answer. Okay. Up to you how you want to have this relationship memorized. You can either remember that one liter is 1,000 centimeters cubed, or you can go with one milliliter is one centimeter cubed. I personally have the milliliter centimeter cubed one memorized. Yes? So one liter of what is uh, One liter of anything is 1,000, like, or is, liter, sorry. One liter of water would be 1,000 centimeters, and oil, yep. let's say, is going to be the same? Yep. What's that? I'm not understanding what you're saying. Don't use that, but then we have memorize, can memorize You can memorize one milliliter is one centimeter cubed, or you can memorize the top one. Both of those are derivable based on our other processes. Why don't use this? Because I wanted you to derive that. We just solved that the relationship between one centimeter cubed is one milliliter right here by doing this math. That's why. If we just jump to this, you didn't learn where it came from. I want you to know where it comes from. Okay. So it's the difference between me telling you this is the answer versus you knowing how to find the answer. That's all it is. Okay. Next thing to worry about, when we deal with our length, hey, some people watch the internet, <laughs> length volume conversions. We need to be very, very careful with these conversions because it's really easy to get sucked into a trap. Okay, what are we talking about? If we've got a square that measures a foot to the side, what is the area or two-dimensional volume of the square with respect to feet and inches? Okay, so if we go through and try to Evaluate this. One thing that I would typically do would be to draw it so I know what I'm looking at. Okay, in theory, we all know what a square looks like. That looks roughly square. We said each side measured a foot. To a side. And we want to figure out the area. How do we figure out the area for a square? Whoops, length 
times width, in this case, one foot times one foot gives us one foot squared. The number may not have changed in this case because we picked something easy like ones. But notice that the unit changed. We went to feet squared. Okay. If we wanted to do it in inches, there's two approaches that you could pull to this. The first thing that you could go through and do, well, first off, questions about what we just did with one foot squared. Okay, good. I don't want any questions on that yet. So that makes me feel better. I'm going to note that. We said our area equals one foot squared because we're going to come back to that. How would we figure it out in inches? There's two methods. All right, there's a method that I wouldn't recommend because it involves a lot of drawing on this. Oh, oh. one foot is 12 <laughs> inches. So we could then go through our uh, area calculation again, except this time we know the sides are 12 inches by 12 inches, and we could come up with... 144 inches squared. Okay, so that to me is kind of the long way, but it's a little bit more straightforward to solve. Yes? I might kill this horse, man. If you told me that the square, I don't know if you measured that or if that's an exact thing, and then your sig fig would screw up 144. Good call. I didn't bring sig figs into this issue, but if you want to bring it in, let's go ahead and fix that. Get rid of that issue altogether. It is 1.00 feet. And that's a very fair question to ask because you need to be concerned about sig figs through everything. And then since you brought it up, you're going to make me fix all the other ones too. Our inches shift around and we'd have 12.0 inches, point zero inches. And I'm just going to put that over the top because I don't want to erase all that. And you might want to fix one foot square. Oh, man. Uh, Freaking sig figs. <laughs> so here, what are we, three sig figs? Yeah. Make sure we aren't losing anything else. One foot squared. Okay. Fair point. Questions about that so far? Okay. There is another way to solve this, okay? And this is the one where you've got to be careful with the trap because you may be solving for an area or a volume that you don't know the formula for. So if I asked you to convert uh, the volume of a star from feet squared into, or sorry, the area of a square from feet squared into inches squared, do you know what all the measurements would be on the star? No, so that shape is a lot more difficult to interpret. We have to come up with another way to do that conversion. What is that other way? Well, we know that we started with 1.00 feet squared. What we're trying to do is to get into what unit? Inches squared. So here's the common mistake. I need to get rid of feet, and I need to bring in inches. What's the relationship between those two? 12 inches in one foot. Most students crank through it. Beautiful, there's my answer. What do we get for an answer? 12 inches squared. Did that match our purple answer? No. What happened? What happened to your units? Track the units and what we've got set up here. Our feet down below cancels the exponent of our numerator. The answer that we got was not inches squared, whoa, but actually 12 inches times feet. That's not inches squared. Hi. So there's now two more approaches on how we can actually fix this. So we all see the mistake, right? Everybody's happy with that mistake? Well, hopefully you know that that mistake is there. So now the next easy fix, 
that the people go through, or a common mistake, is that, well, I wanted to cancel feet squared. Okay, so feet squared, inches squared. My units cancel, right? Do the numbers cancel appropriately? No. When we go through and put in the square, our conversion, 12 inches to 1 foot, is not 12 inches squared to 1 foot squared. If we're going to square it, we have to square the quantity, including the number in front of it. Okay. Some people don't like that format, so there's another way that we can do it. Instead of bringing in the exponents, we could say since we only canceled one of those feet, we need to cancel the other one. What's the relationship? 12 inches, 1 foot. Now when we track the units, what happens? Our feet finally cancel, so I'll double x the 1. And now when we do the math, what happens? We get 144 inches squared. So when you see the exponent show up, be very, very careful with your unit conversions. Okay, it is really easy to get sucked into that trap where you force that exponent in. Do not force it. Cancel it one at a time if you have to. Um, otherwise, you can start to skip steps and do it the way I first showed it. Okay, that you're squaring that entire unit. Does that kind of make sense? So be careful with your volume measurements or even area because you can see this multi-unit or this exponent unit show up and it's very easy to lose track and not cancel your units appropriately. Okay, so it makes sense to cancel them one at a time. Questions about that? Yes? So when, um, when you square both the units, yeah. it comes out to 12 inches square then? Uh, <coughs> careful with the phrasing. You would have 1 times 12 times 12. What's 12 times 12? 144 inches squared. Okay. Other questions with our volumes? When are we done? 30? 40. It's promising. We might actually be able to get through all of this. Okay, so... Um, Give you a couple minutes to work on this one. If you've got questions, raise your hand, and I will come around and try and help you out. Um, the one conversion that you need for this one, I'll go ahead and write up here as well. The conversion that you would need is that one centimeter, that's not right, is it? 2.54 centimeters is one inch. So I'm going to write it in the equation format. You need to interpret that correctly into your unit factor when you go through to solve this. Okay, if you've got questions, please raise your hand. I'll... So if I can get you back here. We want to start with what our answer is. You can crunch it while I'm talking about it. I don't know. We'll start with what we want for our answer. We want inches cubed for our unit. What information are we given? 498 centimeters cubed. So we would then go through and try and figure out our conversion. There's two attempts to it. I'll do it the long way first. Is there a relationship between inches and centimeters? Why did I put inches in the numerator? Because inches shows up in our numerator. Okay. What's the relationship between an inch and a centimeter? One inch is two. So we go through, do our canceling, whoops, centimeters cancels, but then I get a 2 for our centimeters. So what we'll do is repeat that calculation. Uh, 2.54 centimeters. When we run this calculation, our centimeters will cancel out entirely. and we'll have our inches cubed unit. Other way to write it? 
498 centimeters cubed times centimeters cubed. Sorry, let me fix that. 2.54 centimeters in one inch. I now cube top and the bottom. Okay. Both formats work. Uh, Nate, you tested that, right? Did you get the same answer yeah. without the parentheses? Yeah, Order of operations. Uh, we'll do the exponent first in your calculator. So if you just enter it in a straight line, 498 divided by 254 to the third power. Okay. Uh, it will do the exponent first and then do the division. So you should get the correct answer. Down here? Yeah, it says 2.54 to the power of three. Yeah. To the power of three, yes. Yeah. Why? What did we do up here? I don't know. What, what would you put it two times, though? It's like one boy, you show us both How many ways. times? Oh, you yeah. Both ways? yeah, both ways to write it out. Okay, oh, yeah, no, that's no, the question. <laughs> yeah, that's all it is. So two ways to write this. Questions about that? What? Oh, number. What did you guys get for a number on me? I think I heard a 30.4. Is that all it tells you as far as numbers? Oh, it goes 30.38? Okay. So that's what our calculator spits out. Evaluate our sig figs. We can go back to each of our unit conversions. I'm going to do it with just, oh man, I'm out of space. Right here, so we'll do our sig figs in orange. How many sig figs in our conversion, our unit factor? Why three? I'll accept two answers on this. One, it's between systems. We can stick with three. There's a better answer, actually. It's actually not three. That's the better answer. What is it actually? It's infinite. Why is it infinite? That goes back to our footnote. Inches to centimeters is defined as one inch equals 254 centimeters. Three works. It's going to get you the correct answer. But remember, your footnote says that that is actually infinite. Okay. How many sig figs in your first part? Still get three, which means sig figs in our answer. Three, we can underline our first three. Look at the last insignificant digit. What's its relationship to five? It's bigger than five, which means our final answer needs to become, which is probably disappearing off the screen, 30.4 units. Inches cubed. Okay? All good? Good. What about if we have an irregularly shaped object? Okay? So we could jump with our weird star, or we could look at a crown. Anybody recognize the crown? Maybe? I just figured I'd throw it out there. Allegedly, it's the Game of Thrones crown. No. I just figured I'd see what happens. I personally can't watch that show because I don't pay for it. The other option, <laughs> what volume are we measuring in that last one? Pseudo-inappropriate. We could say we're measuring the volume of a really irregularly shaped object, but I was probably going more for measuring the volume of the, the gas it's, uh, coming out of the bowl. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't make this artwork. Somebody else made it. I promise. So how can we measure the volume of these objects? <laughs> In the case of these objects, we don't have standard easy lengths, widths, or heights to measure. So what we have to do is come up with a different way to measure that volume. Next slide. Uh-oh. Okay, there it goes. Archimedes went through and discovered, and I will throw in the caveat here, this is my, my history, because I screwed up history so many times already in this class. So this is my version of the history. Archimedes uh, was tasked with trying to figure out uh, some information about a crown. One of the big things that he needed was the volume of the crown, but he couldn't take it apart or measure different things on it. So what he ended up finding out when he sat in the tub was that he noticed the water level rose when he sat in the tub. Well, what did he go? Eureka! What did he discover? 
discovered that the volume of liquid is equivalent to whatever volume of species was put into it. So he found a way to measure volume without having to do any calculations. He could just look at how much the volume changed after submerging the object. Okay? So what we can do, which we'll do in lab today, or what you did in lab on Tuesday, we could take a graduated cylinder that has clear markings of our volumes. We could fill that with water and drop our object into it. The water is going to displace or be displaced by that object. As it's displaced, the volume will rise. We can then determine the volume of the object based on that displacement. So in this case, without the object, we had initially, oh, come back here. We had initially 50.0 milliliters. After we added our object in there, our final, we had 60.5. To calculate our volume, it's going to be our final minus our initial, and we get, I said 60.5, didn't I? Okay, well, that's 60.5 now. 60.5 <laughs> milliliters minus 50.5 milliliters. The difference between that, 10.0. Why the point zero? Actually, it's not 50.5, it's 50.5. Oh. It was easier the other way. What's the math now? 10.5. Why do we keep the five? Not because there's three sig figs. I was being mean. Trick question. This is an addition subtraction. It's not the number of sig figs. It's the least accurate measurement. Least accurate measurement in this case is the tens place. That's why we keep the 0.5. So the volume of that weird, in this case, jade sample is 10.5 milliliters. So we could do this with any solid object. If we have gases, that's a little bit more odd to deal with. But what we can do is rig up a system similar to this. As that flame heats a sample inside that tube, that sample decomposes to release a gas. That gas then flows into a closed system okay, where it's got water on the end of it. As the gas pushes down on the water, the water backs away from it. The only way it can go is out excuse me, out this tube, and it spits out over into here. So the volume over here increases. The amount of, that that volume increased, so what we'd be looking is this volume going down, this volume going up. The volume that that increased is the volume of the gas that was generated. So it's kind of a neat process. Uh, that's going to be way too complicated of a question to ask on the exam, so you probably won't see that. Okay, but I just want to give you an idea on how you do it. One more thing I want to address with that is you need to be very careful with this. I saw this and went, that's a load of crap. That's not exactly true. Okay? What's the issue? If you take a balloon, anybody take, taking a balloon and added heat to it, what happens to the balloon? Before it explodes. It expands. Heat will cause a volume change, particularly for gases. So when they run this experiment, this heat needs to be far enough away from the gas within this chamber that we don't see a temperature change. Very, very tricky, so you gotta be careful with that. We will talk about, I think we talk about gas laws and how that all relates mathematically later in the semester. Maybe, like I said, first time teaching it, I don't know which one. Next thing we can look at is density. It's an intrinsic property, which means it's part of the material, it doesn't change, okay? Which weighs more, a pound of lead or a pound of feathers? <laughs> They're the same, so it's a, a standard riddle, typically like asking kids and then pointing and laughing at them because they got it wrong. Okay? <laughs> you don't point and laugh at them? Oh, I guess that's just me. Our pound is the same in both cases. So what happens with this, and it turns out to be a, a big psychological problem beyond this, is we start to bring in our own interpretations of it. Our own interpretation is that feathers are softer okay, or take up more volume. So what we could potentially be interpreting with this is not so much the weight, but we start to make an interpretation of the density, the mass per volume that that mass takes up. 
Okay? If we compacted that pound of feathers down into a very small spot, same volume as the lead, and smacked you with it, you really wouldn't like it. <laughs> but if we let the volumes take, or the, the feathers take up their own standard volume and smacked you with that, we call it fun. Okay? We call it a pillow fight, right? <laughs> Most people call it fun. Okay? So what we're looking at here is a feature or a relationship between the mass of the object and the volume in which that object occupies. Okay? This property is known as density. So density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. Okay? So what units would we put on that? Take a guess. I heard grams per liter. That's a reasonable first stab at it. We might also see grams per milliliter. Another common one, kilograms per liter. Whoops, I shouldn't have put equals in there. Those aren't equal. That was a bad thing to do, right? A liter, one over liters, doesn't equal one over a milliliter. Okay. They're standard units for density, but those units aren't equal to each other. Okay. So why would we pick one unit over the other? Whichever one generates a number that is most easy to deal with. Okay, so if we went through and took a look, okay, yeah, it's a new conversion factor to relate mass to volume, just like we've been seeing with everything else. So we now have a new relationship that we can shift through here. We can convert a volume into a mass if we know something about the material. That something has to be its density. So we've got that conversion factor. Why do we pick different units? Well, if we take a look at ice versus water versus water vapor, ice and water have very similar masses for that given volume. Okay, so we might report these as 0.917 grams per one centimeter cubed or per, what is a centimeter cubed equal? Milliliter. So we could see it as grams per milliliter. When we shift to water, we get one gram per milliliter. Again, fairly standard, simple, and easy to work with. But what happens when we move to water vapor? So now it's in its gas state. Now we have to include a whole bunch of extra zeros in it because for that same volume, water takes up a lot less mass. So we have 0 .000736 grams per milliliter. That number is now so small, I don't like decimals, that I then try and convert that into a different unit using the different prefixes. So we could convert it into milligrams per milliliter. Or I could go through and convert it into grams per liter. I think that would get us up to a, a ballpark number that we like. Okay? So the units that end up being associated with your density just depends on it generating a number that looks reasonable to us. So typically, the numbers that we're happy with fall between zero and nine. Okay. Those are kind of our happy range. And really, we could even get rid of the zero. We could probably go one to nine. We can push higher than that. We can go to tens, twenties, or whatever. But that starts to make the number more unmanageable. Okay. So we pick our units depending on what we want to work with or what we want to see. And we can then convert those units into something else using our dimensional analysis tools that we've dealt with already. Okay. So I'm not going to do another one of those because we've been doing those problems continuously. So let's look at some densities of some common substances. So we could go through and now compare these densities to each other, and we could do some different forms of interpretation with this. Um, that interpretation usually falls in something along these lines. We could take a graduated cylinder, and we could put different things in it and note where those different things accumulate within the cylinder. Okay. Why do we see this stacking effect? Why do they not all mix? Some of it comes to density. Some of it's going to come to their intermolecular forces, which we haven't talked about, how those species interact with each other. Okay. Their structure is so different that they don't want to mix with each other, so they physically repel. You see that repulsion when you mix or try to mix oil and water. What happens? They separate out. Okay. What order they separate into is dependent on their densities. So if we take a look at L1, 
water, and L2. What can you tell me about the densities? L2, is most dense. L2 ends up being the most dense. The higher the density, the lower it sits in our solution. Like a stone or a rock. Okay, like a stone or a rock. If we tossed a stone or a rock into water, why does it sink to the bottom? Because it is more dense than water. So it'll fall to the bottom. The same thing applies with liquids. So when we go through and take a look at these liquids, L2 is more dense than water. L1 is the least dense. So if we had to rank our densities, we would say most or biggest density would be our L2, which is bigger than water, bigger than L1. Yes? Is there any liquid that Liquid, the well, these are generic liquids, yeah. so we haven't specified what they are. Um, off the top of my head, I could come up with three liquids that would work for this. L1, we could do diethyl ether, mix that with water, and dichloromethane. Okay. Does that mean anything to you to know those? Mm -hmm. No. What you're responsible for is being able to compare those densities. So if we had to associate a number with this, L2, if we stick with uh, the example that we just picked, we said it was dichloromethane, is 1.2 grams per milliliter. Water, 1.0 grams per milliliter. L1 for ether, 0 0.7 grams per milliliter. Okay. So we would see that stacking. What happens with the blocks? Let's take a look at S1. What can you tell me about S1's density? It's less than water. Why is, or sorry, if it's less than water, where should it be? Above water or below water? Okay. If it's less than water, it should sit on top of the water. So we could go through and say, oh, that's not supposed to be SI, it's supposed to be S1. Water has a greater density than S1. What other information could we specify on this? Is S1 interacting with any other liquid? L1, what's its relationship to L1? It has to be a higher density than L1. Why? Because it's on the bottom. Because it's on the bottom. I keep wanting to make those eyes. Okay. You should be able to go through and specify S2 and S3 according to similar procedures or similar, similar processes. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. We're going to come back to that in a quick second here. Last thing that we could talk about, um, maybe... Hopefully no one gets offended. Anybody brewed beer? What? Okay. Figure the age category might not quite be there yet. Um, in the brewing process, one thing that you might see on bottles, particularly craft beers, is you might see something known as the IG and the and the FG. Anybody know what those are? Initial gravity, final gravity. The reason those are put on the bottle is in the process of brewing, you change the density of the liquid. Why does the density change? And the process of making your beer, you start making alcohol. Alcohol has a different density than water. So what we can use is measure the gravity, how it measures or how our solution compares to a water sample. That comparison is known as specific gravity. You're comparing your substance to a standard. That standard in that case happens to be water. So when we're referring to specific gravities or gravities of anything, typically it's in reference to water. Okay? So if you have a higher gravity, that means it is more dense than water. If you have a lower gravity, that means it's less dense than water. Okay? So it's a similar idea. It's just another way to rank these things without actually doing calculations. Blah, 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 blah. 
Um, these are all practice with density, right? Yeah. So we are just about at time. So what we're going to do is I will attempt to work through one of these problems really fast. Well, probably not. What I'm going to do is talk instead. You'll notice that we have one, two, well, one, two, three, four, five, five slides. Oh, five slides at the end of the show, which I now can't go back through. Uh, why address this? We haven't talked about that material. The material that we haven't covered is temperature and heat. What can we say about temperature and heat as far as its presence on the exam? It's not there because we haven't talked about it. I don't know what sections that is in the textbook, but I think it's the very last section of your chapter. So temperature and heat will not show up. Density will show up. 